is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 192, covering the week of October 21st through October 25th, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute, like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media buttons on our website, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, abbevilleinstitute.org. While you're there, give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook. You'll get our daily dose of Dixie, Monday through Friday, and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Please download our free mobile app. Just go to wherever you get your mobile application, search for Abbeville Institute. It'll come up. It's a great way to keep up with the Institute on the go. You get access to our podcast, all of our audio lectures, which number over 200. And, of course, anything else we do at the Institute. Uh, We, of course, exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like the podcast, you like the website, you like everything that we do, please consider a tax-deductible donation. Just go to abbevilleinstitute.org, click on that support tab. It'll give you the donor options. You can donate monthly or annually or a one-time gift, however you want to donate. And, of course, get your Abbeville Institute apparel. Just click on that Shop tab on the same page, and you'll be taken out to our store where you can buy your embroidered Abbeville Institute shirts, hats, golf towels, all kinds of good stuff. So a lot of great ways to support the Institute and a lot of great ways to help contribute financially. Also, click on that Amazon Smile button at the top of the page. When you shop at Amazon, you give us a few pennies. So uh, we've actually earned a little bit of cash over the years on that thing. So it's a great way to support the Institute, a painless and really free way for you to support the Institute. You're already shopping at Amazon, and Amazon contributes to the Abbeville Institute. So, I mean, that's that's a pretty awesome thing. All right, well, let's talk about the material for the week. Um, This week, it seems a little disjointed in what we had and, and hard to pin down a theme. But I think one of the things that uh, should stand out if you're reading the piece by Ben Jones or the piece by Neil, uh, I'm sorry, Neil Kumar on Thursday, or even the the poetry sample or on uh, on Friday, the the poem by John Parker and Mike Tuggle, um, one of the things that should stand out is that the uh, attack on the South by outside forces is unrelenting. And we all know this. We've talked about it for probably close to 100 of the podcasts we produce. We're at 192. But I think over it, it's just getting worse. Um, and I'm not sure this is ever going to let up. Uh, I actually received an email from, uh, from through my personal email account. Uh, and it... Um, It said this, uh, quote, We literally just saw hundreds of liberal left-wing idiots in Pittsburgh swarm in and terrorize the community over our Confederate Veterans Monument. Transplant Yankees have taken over the county board of commissioners, and they worked with Antifa to coordinate the whole thing. Much of their correspondence is available online on Facebook and Twitter, but we have a governor in North Carolina who is a communist sympathizer as well. I'm really sick of this whole thing. UNC Chapel Hill has been taken over too. At one point, did there cease to be a traditional Southern influence in government, academia, and journalism? I feel abandoned in my own state, and the world is closing in on us with no avenues of recourse to avail ourselves to. These young radicals of Antifa are making it public knowledge that if they ever get in power, they plan to have re-education camps and executions via the guillotine. We need more input from traditional-minded Southern intellectuals on a local basis to help us make our case in defense. Now he asks... Uh, for the Abbeville Institute to organize things. We can't do that at the Abbeville Institute. We're here as an educational arm. But, of course, I encourage anyone to try to do everything they can to fight this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and, and uh, your local city councils get involved. But uh, this is an email that's really indicative of the problem in the South today. The attack is coming from inside, and uh, you have people like George Soros now figuring out that the way forward is by funding local operations, not really focusing on the center, because the center is not going to do much. But funding local operations 
uh, going in and, and getting involved in local school boards, for example, or getting involved in these local city councils, doing things like this because he understands that 20 people at a city council meeting is more effective than 20 people or even 200 people at the U.S. Capitol. Where did the South stop? Where did these, with the traditional South, uh, where the influence stop in government, academia, and journalism? A long time ago. Uh, maybe not so much in government, uh, but certainly this began uh, in the 1980s and 90s. Academia in the 1960s. Journalism, same thing. And so what we have now are um, individuals who are dedicated to going into local communities and trying to take these things apart. So let's talk about that Thursday piece to the Southern Soldiers by Neil Kumar. It shows a picture in Arkansas, Bentonville, Arkansas, of the Confederate monument there. It had a musket, rifle, uh, that was broken in half. Um, what's really interesting about that, and I found this image to be uh, so surprising, is that it's so similar to the George Washington statue on the uh, State House there in Columbia, South Carolina, where the Union Army came in, the Yankees came in, and broke part of the statue and took it with them. George Washington. I mean, yeah, these people are really you know interested in the founding. Broke the George Washington statue. Um. And Neil Kumar uh, says, look, I mean, um, he says, these interlopers dare to decry the shame of Bentonville and to, to dictate us to us how we must change our town for their craven image of the enlightened cities from where they came. How dare they? How dare we allow this? The monument's inscription, beautiful in its solemnity, reads, to the southern soldiers, they fought for home and fatherland. Their names are born on honor's shield. Their record is with God. He says, we must remember that the Confederate soldier did not fight for any ideology, but rather for his home. They fought for their posterity, for their descendants, and for the backyard graves of their fathers before them, for the hills and streams of their communities. They fought for, they fought out of the purest love of family, not of hatred. These monuments were erected to honor the memory of those who sacrificed so much, often everything, to defend hearth and home. To disfigure these is as the Taliban annihilating the Bamiyan Buddhas. For those Scalawags who support the effort to erase our inheritance, to allow people who not, know nothing about Bentonville, who look at us with nary but a sneer, to deny us our heritage, to defile the graves of your ancestors. We are not worthy of our descendants if we do not deem to honor our forefathers, those giants among men who served us so faithfully. This is really the issue. I mean, this type of stuff should be uh, met with so much scorn across the South. The problem is we're losing a uh, demographic fight, ultimately. Um, and when I mean demographic fight, you have a lot of transplants coming into the South from all over. This is the Sun Belt. People from all over the United States who really don't care about the traditional South or traditional Southern history. They just look at it with scorn, as Mr. Kumar says. Um, one of the things I, I was reading uh, in a book by Forrest Neighbors, I mean, and I, and I bring this book up, not because it's a good book, it's a terrible book in a lot of ways. Forrest Neighbors, though, is a conservative. Um, and he wrote a little book about Reconstruction where he says in the beginning, he's walking around the South and he sees these monuments and he just has so much shame, he says, for these monuments. And he says he wants to teach the South how to be good Americans. I mean, this is the same type of cultural imperialism that Southerners faced right after the war. And it reminded me of uh, the episode with uh, Richard Taylor, Zachary Taylor's son, who was told by a German, well, you know, we're going to teach you to be good Americans. And Taylor responded, hey, I don't, can you teach me? Because my family's been here since the 1600s, and they've been involved in virtually everything that's ever happened in the United States. My father was president, and I've, uh, whether it's the Declaration, the Constitution, we... I mean, we've been around for all of that, but would you please teach me how to be a good American? And so these people are coming in the South, and they're saying, well, you don't know about your own history. Well, let's teach you. There's also a story uh, uh, Pryor, Dorothy Pryor, who wrote uh, Reading the Man, the book, it's one of these awful books about Lee that uh, all the Lee detractors run around 
uh, citing now, which is they cite it incorrectly. If you go and actually read the book, and she even says things that aren't contradict what these people are saying. But anyways, it's a horrible book. I've reviewed it for the Abbeville Institute. But she um, she was at a meeting before she died, and uh, she got very angry, agitated with some people who were supporting Robert E. Lee. You don't really know Lee. I know Lee. You don't know Lee. Uh, Lee is not a good man. This is the kind of cultural imperialism that uh, Southerners are facing. It's the... It really is a new reconstruction. You see, even after the, the first reconstruction, monuments, of course, were left alone. Uh, some of the monuments were built during the first reconstruction. Not many. Some were. Um, but, of course, the South had very little money, so the, there was a surge in monuments 25 years after the war, 50 years after the war, 75 years after the war, 100 years after the war. This is when you see people reflecting on these things. And, of course, dedicated to the soldier 99% of the time, the common soldier. I mean, if these people really were for the people, the common man, that's who these monuments are dedicated to. And uh, if they really were interested in, well, I mean, you, you know, I understand if you're supporting uh, the, the common soldier, but that's not, they don't want that. They don't want these things in cemeteries. They don't want them anywhere. Get rid of it. Uh, supposedly, in, in where I live, the, uh, all the, and I, and I don't know why, but all the little first national flags were removed from a Confederate cemetery. Maybe because it offended somebody. Who knows? That's just recently happened. But again, this is the effort. This is the objective. To eradicate any part of tradition of the traditional South because the traditional South stands in the way of their radical agenda to remake, as Barack Obama said in 2009, to remake America. That's their objective. Remaking America. So... This is, I'm not surprised by this action at the Bentonville Monument. It's been vandalized, and it's not been vandalized just with spray paint or paint. It's been, just, it's actually been damaged, irreparably damaged. And then you have Ben Jones' piece on Monday. He took a picture when he was driving through the eastern shore of Virginia, and I've seen this sign so many times uh, when I would drive from South Carolina up to see my folks in that area, the Eastern Shore. And it's right as you get into Virginia, as you cross from Maryland into Virginia on the Delmarva Peninsula. There's a big sign, it's a gas station, and it says, it's a Dixieland gas station, and it says the South starts here. And this part of, of the Delmarva Peninsula is cotton farms. It's a really interesting part of, a forgotten part in many ways of, uh, of Virginia, Maryland. Of course, it also contains Delaware. Uh, it's where Abel Upshur is from, one of the great thinkers in the traditional antebellum South, the great constitutional scholars of the antebellum South. But Ben Jones has a picture, and he stands there, to, and he put this on his Facebook page, and of course people got very upset about this. Oh my gosh, they was triggered. And so he wrote a response to that. And, and it, he says some things here that are, uh, it should be common sense. Um, and one of the things that Ben Jones often talks about is the early civil rights movement and how it was not even concerned about symbols or monuments at all. In fact, um, I found two paragraphs really interesting. He says, Dr. Martin Luther King felt that racial integration worked best in the South because of the shared culture that had existed here for generation after generation over centuries. He was right. Dr. King didn't have a problem with the Confederate flag. His problem, and still the problem of most good-hearted Southerners, was those who try to use it as a symbol of racial division. This is one of the interesting quotes. He says, I have a photograph of John Lewis from the early 1960s, where he, had a, where he and a white student are proudly holding that old Confederate battle flag as a symbol of Southern unity. I wish we could see that picture. Um... He says, a couple of years back, I was invited, invited panelist at a conference hosted by Andrew Young, who was Dr. King's right-hand man and is one of the most respected and courageous people on the planet. The event was at 
Morehouse College, Dr. King's alma mater down in Atlanta. The issue under debate was the Confederate flag. And he said that during the Civil Rights Movement, no one even mentioned the flag, that it was irrelevant. The issues then were basic and real, equal, equal access to a public accommodations, voting rights, and educational equality. Those issues are still basic and real. And then he says this, don't you think it's condescending that a lot of liberal white folks seem to believe that African Americans can't understand the use of symbols in different contexts? They apparently think that blacks can't discern the difference between a flag being used in a heritage museum, a historical film, or a Confederate cemetery, or even on the Dukes of Hazard. By its being waved by a bunch of Ku Klux clowns running around in bedsheets burning crosses. What a condescending insult to common sense. He says the thing that's really at risk here is freedom to think. Freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, to arrive at different conclusions. And he says this is the problem. Street names are being changed, statues are being vandalized, and monuments are being torn down. Anything that remotely offends the thought police on the radical left must be put into Trotsky's ash bin of history and be forever den den denigrated. I'm sorry. That is what is happening. And it is real. And it is real. But you see, they understand the bigger objective. There was a few years back, I wrote a piece about the effort to, to uh, change the Maryland state song, Maryland, My Maryland. And it was in Time magazine. And the author of that particular piece pointed out why he was really against it. Because it's defiant. It's dissident. You see, the Southern tradition is, in many ways, a big middle finger to the American empire. And it has to go for that reason. It has to go because it doesn't fit with the proposition nation idea. It has to go because it's something that doesn't necessarily mesh with modern American society. And it doesn't mesh for a variety of reasons. People say, well, that's right, because it's all about race and slavery. No, that's not why. In fact, the piece on Tuesday points out why it's not why. It's a book review of the dialogue between uh, Alan Tate and Andrew Lytle. If you don't know who they are, they are two of these Southern agrarians the fugitive agrarians from Vanderbilt University, and uh, who wrote I'll Take My Stand. And, uh, wonder, I mean, wonderful historians, authors. And they say some things that are very critical of Robert Lee here. But And so uh, Tom Rash talks about that. But they also talk about what the South means. And Lytle, of course, was the agrarian farmer, and... The agrarian tradition, the Jeffersonian agrarian tradition, was being lost already by the 1920s and 30s. And you see, that was the lasting part of the South, what they hoped would remain. It wasn't about race and slavery. Um, it was about what the South represented Um, and Lytle, uh, Alan Tate was concerned that they were focusing too much, they were idolizing the Old South. And Lytle responded to that. He said, quote, This business of place and location exposes perhaps a temperamental difference between us. He says, I don't see how you can save the truth of God and man except in the terms of the conventions of some society. Meaning, place. How can you save something if you don't anchor it to somewhere? And that somewhere was, of course, the South. Um, and I think that that's important to understand. In order to save tradition in society, you have to anchor it somewhere. And as many scholars across the generations have pointed out, the South is that somewhere. It, it is the embodiment of traditional America. Russell Kirk pointed this out, of course, um, as did H.L. Mencken. I mean, it was, it was the area that had to be celebrated. Because if you did not celebrate the South, 
What are you really, where in the United States can you point to traditional culture being maintained? New England? New England was always interested in reform at some level. I mean, you can say, well, the Puritans were very conservative. Well, they, they were in their own way, in their own reformist way. I mean, look, they wanted to purify the church. It wasn't reformist enough for them. So you see, there was that, that push. It was, it was too orthodox, too traditional. So even in that way, the reformists... Now, of course, you can say that some of the things they did in society, and we would say, well, I mean, uh, that's conservative, particularly now. They were pushing against some of the more secular things. But um, the fact that the New England region, the burnt-over district of New York and then in New England, were so interested in reform throughout history, I mean, this is because they were always moving in this notion of progress, the city upon a hill. We've talked about that over and over on this podcast, so no need to, uh, to reiterate that. But the, the South was the last place in America that you found traditional order, traditional society. Um, even Tate and Lytle, I mean, look, they, they criticized Lee for being too European. It, Forrest was... Uh, the embodiment of the real Southerner, but Lee wasn't, and I think that has to do with their. Uh, they they don't like the fact that Virginia is so important. I mean, they, they they're trying to distance Virginia from everything, but Virginia. I mean, look, Calhoun pointed out if Virginia would just lead, the South would have been okay. So this is their own bias coming in at play here. But Lee, they say Lee's a European. Forrest is a Southerner. I mean, this is because Lee really was the last of that cavalier generation. The cavalier gentleman. The old gentleman of Virginia. I mean, that was an important part in that culture, that cavalier culture, which wasn't tied into any religion or ethnic background. It was a culture. Uh, And when I use things like uh, and I've had uh, I had somebody email me about this the other day when I've used things like Celt, when I say the Celtic South. I'm not talking about Celtic uh, as far as a race. It's a culture, and it's the borderlands is what I'm talking about there. It's what David Hackett Fisher was talking about in the borderlands. And this is, it's a, it's a broad term, and it's very difficult to define. But when you say Cavalier, it's the same thing. When you say Puritan or Quaker, it's the same thing. You can be a Puritan or a Quaker or a Cavalier or a Celt. Uh, regardless of ethnic background, right? I mean, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the Irishman, was a cavalier uh, because of his culture. The Orthodox Catholic Marylander, um, he was really a cavalier. So uh, this is important because that cavalier culture is so central to what the old South meant and what the traditional South meant. And of course, as the Union Army comes in, they start taking all of that away. And the piece by John Marcourt talks about you know, the tidewater, the war in the tidewater of Virginia. One of the things I always found fascinating about that, of course, is what the Union Army did in these regions. You know, they ransacked, for example, John Tyler's home. Of course, they took everything they could out of George Washington's home. They stole stuff. Um, the uh, Arlington House. I mean, anywhere they could find things to take, they did. Now, now I mean, Mount Vernon was kind of off limits. I mean, it was protected, but um, certainly the uh, Arlington House, which had Washington artifacts, all these things were stolen. Uh, you know, uh, Zachary Taylor's plantation burned. Of course, that's in Louisiana, but burned. So you had this push by the Union to eradicate this traditional South. I mean, if they really were interested in preserving the founding, then you would think they would have been interested in preserving this lineage. But of course, anything that smacked of the old South and the old traditional South, I mean, look, when when John Tyler died, John Tyler, whose father was friends with Thomas Jefferson, 
had, I mean, John Tyler supped at Jefferson's ta table, and young John Tyler. Um, but he's he dies in 1862 because he became part of the Confederate Congress and seceded with the South. I mean, the fact is, I mean, he wasn't even recognized anymore. John Tyler, President John Tyler. Zachary Taylor, former president, plantation burned because his son's a Confederate general. This is the kind of thing, you know, you look at the lineage, the Hamptons in South Carolina. You look at tra the tradition that's being wiped out because of that war and because of the vindictive nature of the Union. And this was what has just been carried forward. This is anti-American. This is treason. It's treason? These people are treason? Generations that go back, you know, at that point, 200 years, now almost 400 years? You're talking about treason? No. It's traditional America. But see, these people aren't really traditional America. They're bent on tearing it down. And one of the things I loved, the, the poetry samplers, let me, let me get into that. Um, the first is by John Parker. When I see that flag, and he's not talking about the Confederate flag. He's talking about the U.S. flag. And the image that we have on this is the very famous image, Soiling of Old Glory in Boston, where a guy is beating down a black guy with the U.S. flag. Now, I've never seen anyone do that with a Confederate flag. But here it is in Boston in the 1970s. John Parker, when I see that flag flying, I see my people dying, defending their land from its invasion. When I see that flag waving, I feel my people's craving for the short-lived independence which that flag took away. When I see that flag blowing, I see a monster growing, using force to exert its will on those whose total resistance is feeble. When I see that flag spreading, I see a woman heading down a road begging to be relieved of paying homage to it, saying, If I love that flag, I would not make those live under it who do not want to. When I see that flag outstretch, I can see the wretched life it forced upon my country, bad in war, worse in peace. When I see that flag ascending, I see four young lives ending because it felt the world was its exclusive domain, that, that peace must come only as it says. Most of all, when I see that flag is flying, I can see a little boy crying because it is winter. His only coat has been taken by one who waved that flag because the coat had Confederate buttons. That's the tyranny of this occupation in his mind, of this Reconstruction, this third Reconstruction. And then, of course, Atlanta 2019 by Mike Tuggle. Grizzer, Grizzard, you should be writing these days. The Southland needs you. She is a mess. Our colleges, most businesses, the press disown our old-time Southern ways. Of course, Louis Grizzard, he's talking about. Our monuments to heroes, they would raise or hide museums. Through history, they suppress Oh, come back to us, Lewis. Relieve our distress and remind carpetbaggers, Delta's always ready, always. Your typewriter sang like a well-tuned viola, praising simple pleasures like bourbon Coca-Cola, or teasing rude transplants for lack of couth, and making us smile as you spoke the naked truth. Your wit was keen, and you scorned all facade, a proud son of the South, by sure the grace of God. Louis Grizzard is a great example of Southern humor, culture, tradition. Taken too young. But again, all of this is this defiance. People could see it then. People could see it in the 20s and 30s. People could see it in the last 150 years. They understood the real issues. Of course, Ben Jones saying, I mean, people now don't even realize what was going on in the 60s. It's just kind of become this time. Pointless. But, uh, beginning with that letter, letter again, going back to what I mentioned, get involved in your local areas. Use the materials we give you. There's all kinds of information on our website. Over a thousand articles on Southern tradition, culture, history, pieces like Ben Jones. Bring these things up. Hey, you know Andrew Young? Pose of the Confederate flag. Or John Lewis, I should say, John Lewis posed the Confederate flag. Andrew Young, King's right-hand man, said, well, we don't care about that flag. That's what people said. And why are you worried about it? Because it's an avenue to make waves. And that's it. It's uh, It can be depressing, but on the other hand, um, 
there are, this is why the Institute exists, to try to push back. You have to take the material we give you and run with it. But we're here to help in that way. We're here to help by producing this podcast and the website and the conferences and the things we do. Until next time, good day. Good day.